Hey there, it's Weekend Vacations, and welcome to a very special Blu-ray review. I'm reviewing the Collector's Edition Blu-ray of Shocker from Scream Factory. Now, before I even get started with this review, I definitely have to say thank you from the bottom of my heart to Corey Foster for sending this to me. And um, I really had a blast watching, not only watching this film again, but also watching the features. I honestly think this is one of Screen Factory's best collector's editions as of late. There were some things that I wish could have been on here, but um, they still did a great job in terms of the features, in terms of the presentation of the film, and uh, definitely, I was, I was also a lot like my friend Matt when it comes to this cover art, because it's like, well, it's kind of simple. I mean, it's just Pinker, and there's no, not an ensemble cast or anything. But I, I I've also uh, warmed up to this uh, cover art. Um, as you can see, that's the slipcase, and then there's the original cover art from the poster, movie poster cover art right here. Now, um, and of course, you know the the Blu-ray looks has the poster cover art as well. So before I get into the features and give you guys a little bit of some choice stuff I remember from the features, uh, I'll talk about the film itself. It looks fantastic. It is one of the best tra the best transfer I've ever seen the film in. It looks great. It looks crisp. It looks clean. It looks really good. It's It sounds great as well it's the best the film has ever looked and sounded um, easily big upgrade over the DVD um, as for the rest of the features there are two things I'm not going to talk about I'm not going to talk about the commentary tracks if you want to hear in-depth thoughts on the commentary tracks or at least a little bit of info here and there check out my friend Matt Rambara for life's review of the blu-ray because the commentary tracks is like, I got a math test to study for and all that kind of stuff on Wednesday. So I spent a, I, I was studying last night and I, did, I worked on my homework. And so I didn't really have time to listen to the commentary tracks. And I'm not really the biggest, I'm not the best guy to be asking about reviewing commentary tracks. Like there's only like a few commentary tracks I really like. I like the one, The Creep Show, with uh, Tom Savini and uh, George A. Romero. And uh, I do, my friend keeps telling me about the Chud, the Chud commentary, and the commentaries, of course, John Carpenter and Kurt Russell for The Thing, and, and Big Trouble in Little China, which I definitely do need to sit down and watch and listen to sometime. But I have more fun doing commentaries with my friends, for instance, versus listening to commentaries, but that's just me. I also like the commentary track for Tank Girl. That was pretty good as well. With Lori Petty and I think the director. Um, anyway, because pretty much it has a commentary Wes Craven from back in the day, which I, I probably would think is a lot of the same things that he's talking about in the his interviews from back in 1988 or 89 uh, on the featurettes to, that are included on this on this Blu-ray. And uh, audio commentary director of photography, Jocks Hockin, producer Robert Engelman, and composer William Goldstein. From what my friend Matt was saying, it doesn't really sound like much. Uh, but anyway, what you have is a series of featurettes. You have about a 15-minute interview with Mitch Pileggi, which I really liked. Um, you find out that he originally auditioned for the role of coach. But then they decided he should try out for the role of Horace Pinker because of his size and his stature and his physique. And uh, originally, Wes was he was he was definitely he knew that he was capable of being the physical part of Horace Pinker, but he didn't really know for sure if he had the acting chops to really pull this off until he saw. A, I think it was a little. Audition, the audition that he had, and uh, he did one. You just saw him evolve as an actor. This is his. This is one of Mitch's first really big roles. He uh, he always loved acting. He like he said in the interview, he really loved getting that immediate feedback 
from audiences whenever he was on stage. So he really liked that a lot. And he went on and went to a different career for a little bit. And then he was done with that part of his life. And then he went back to LA and started acting in more plays. And he still loved getting that immediate feedback. So then he decided, all right, maybe I, I, I want to become an actor. I want to become an actor in films and television. And so he eventually, that's how he met Wes Craven. And then eventually he was able to become Horace Pinker with Shocker. Uh, Wes was so impressed by uh, M Mitch Pileggi's capabilities as an actor. That's why he wrote uh, a specific line of dialogue for him. The whole speech in the in, in the uh, execution sequence where he's strapped up in the chair and he talks about uh, his uh, his relation to Jonathan you know when he reveals the big reveal that he's his father and uh, you know I was beating a real good until you shot me in the knee with that shotgun with that big gun you little peckerhead uh, so he wrote that speech. It wasn't originally in the screenplay, and Wes wrote that speech specifically for for Mitch because he was really impressed with his with his acting, and and uh, so it's a testament to how good Mitch Pileggi was in this film. Mitch also he was talking about how with the makeup, with the whole burn makeup where his head's supposed to be all. Excuse me, I just got an itch in my nose. They're driving me nuts. I mean, really mad. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> but going back to you know the the special feature of Mitch Pileggi, Mitch was um, he was he was in the makeup chair and he had the uh, the makeup effects put on his head for the burn makeup, and they were talking and he had a little bit of hair still on the side of his head, and not much. But they were like, uh, he was like, how is this going to work? Well, we're going to put glue on your hair. And then we're going to put like a skull cap on. He's like, no, you ain't putting glue on my hair. I'll just shave, I'll shave my head. Uh, and then um, he also says it was a very physical role that he did a lot. Of, he wanted to do a lot of his stunts because he was young and he was in good shape. And uh, sadly, he, he really regrets that now because it ended up giving him some some pretty bad arthritis uh, in his old age so um, he definitely did pay the price for his physicality and shocker but it was that he he doesn't regret it he, he does he, he really loves the, the opportunity he really loved the opportunity to play Horace Pinker for Wes Craven and it's definitely a, an experience and, and a performance that he remembers very fondly he also talked about how when he was shooting a lot of scenes with with uh, John with with uh, Peter Berg, that in the set it was just hot as hell. It was like over a hundred degrees. It was like really really hot, and he says that just added to the whole um, atmosphere and mood of the entire scene. Um, and so yeah, uh, Mitch seems like a really nice guy and. Uh, he talked about also about if there was going to be a remake, which I really don't want to see. It was going to be a remake that he would want to be in the film in some capacities, maybe a cameo, maybe a corner, maybe some guy in the background repairing a TV or something, uh, because he really wants to be a part of it, which that's cool. That's cool. Um, he said he'd be willing to do anything for the new Shocker, except for, you know, being Horace Pinker, because he's afraid it, it would kill him, uh, because he's so racked with our arthritis sadly from from the role um so yeah uh it was it was an interesting interview about 15 minutes um it was uh it was not a lot of fun to hear mitch pledge talk about his role as horace pinker and then after the end credits he ends up uh he says no more mr nice guy so that was nice to hear him do that again. And he laughs. And you can just tell he had so much fun playing the role. I mean, you could tell it, it you know, in, in the in the, in the the finished film anyway. And, and he was also talking about one more thing I remember is where he was talking about how he went in 
and he remembers the premiere of the film and how he he uh he went to the premiere and everything invited his family and his friends and he always he remembered how uncomfortable he was watching himself play such a crazy killer and he was there were certain scenes where he was just uncomfortable watching it and i can only imagine how uncomfortable his his family members would have would would have been considering the subject material he want he, he was really glad to do it and he was really glad to be there to to show his family that hey i'm here i'm doing it but then he's playing like a, a psychopathic killer uh but yeah um it was uh it was a good interview it was a, it was a good uh, bit of feature a special feature um bit short but definitely sweet uh then there was an interview with cammy cooper who uh played uh as called allison's adventures and the other one with mitch pelleggi was called i think the, something to do with the cable guy and uh which is which is weird weird because he's I don't think he's really a cable guy he's a TV repairman so um, I think I think that's what it, I, I could be completely wrong so uh, anyway I was just trying to see if I could find an, uh, anything that really talked about it but uh, Cammy Cooper it's called Allison's Adventures, and it's another short one. I think it's about like 10, 12. I think it's about almost the same length as the Mitch Pelleggi interview. And it was really nice to hear from her again. And uh, she talks about how shooting the, how she got the role, how she started in acting. She was a really big fan of Mae West, which is interesting at the time because she was a young girl and she was a fan of this really old uh, movie star but she was really inspired by her because she was one of the first big women big female movie stars who also created her own production company and so she was really inspired by that and I guess her and her friend were just goofing around one day with a photo shoot they just did it for fun they just and uh, they ended up getting in the semifinals and uh, Cami Cooper which was about eight or nine got uh, an agent she was uh, she got an agent and then the agent got her to do some TV work and and uh, some commercials and stuff and then she got her first big break in I think like father like son and um, so then she was in that film and then she decided to do the go to the audition for shocker because she was a really big fan of A Nightmare on Elm Street because it was a film that scared the crap out of her when she saw it in the theater. So she ended up getting the role and she really liked how strong Wes had made his female ca characters and, and Allison is no exception. Even though she dies, she's still a really strong part of the film and, and Cammy really liked that about the character. And uh, she talks about her experiences while shooting the certain sequences like uh, the sequence where she's covered in blood and meets with Jonathan and she was talking about how uncomfortable and cold and sticky and, and awful that experience was. It, it, it makes sense. I mean, you're covered in this fake blood and it's just it's not a very comfortable experience. And then she talks about a fun story where there really wasn't a shower on the set. So she had to end up getting in her car and driving home covered in this fake blood in, her, in a nightgown and, and almost caused a few accidents along the way because people are stopping and be like holy shit what the fuck did she kill somebody she's looking like uh um what's her name she's looking like uh oh come on gone girl she's looking like the like the actress in gone girl which is just covered in blood <laughs> you know so uh people were definitely surprised she also talks about the uh, shooting the sequence in the lake where it was on an above ground pool that was uh, built somewhere in LA and uh, there was chairs underneath the water that it ended up carrying her around and she was talking about how it took multiple takes and was once again not the most comfortable experience uh, and then she talked about how hard it was to act to a light bulb for instance because in those sequences where she's a ghost and talking to Jonathan or talking to Pinker she's not actually on the actual set with the actors 
she's uh, on a sound effects stage, special effects stage, and she is there having to act at a light bulb or, you know, this, this piece of paneling or something that says Pinker, you know. And so she said it was a very difficult thing to do to emote effectively to a light bulb. But she, when she saw the finished product, she, she thought it really worked out really well. Excuse me, sorry, I just, just have this fucking itch in my nose. It's driving me fucking nuts. <laughs> Wasn't picking my nose, it's itching it. <laughs> anyway. Uh, too much information, I'm sorry. It just, if you've ever had that, you know what I'm talking about. It's just like, it's just fucking annoying. Um, but anyway, going back to Cammy Cooper, she was uh, also she talked about how when she saw the premiere, she, she when she went to the premiere, there was an electric chair. And actually, speaking of electric chair, she talked about a fun story when she went to Wes Craven's house and she met with Wes. And she was saying that he had his, his, the electric chair in his living room and he loved sitting in it. And he had all these things that he would try to prank her with and try to scare her, like it's some Halloween horror maze, which shows you how how cool of a person Wes was. I mean, we really, this world is really gonna miss Wes Craven. And uh, then she talks about again with, with Electric Chair, where it was actually there at the premiere, and cast and crew were sitting in it for photos. And she's about five or six months pregnant, and she's showing. And, and, and she sits in the chair and gets the photo, gets the photo taken. And then her publicist takes her aside and is like, what did you just do? Like, do you know how horrible that image looked of a pregnant woman in an electric chair? <laughs> and and uh, then she goes to the premiere and she was talking about how she really liked the film, but she couldn't help but notice uh different things like she she couldn't couldn't take her away took it couldn't take herself out of the film as an actress so she's watching the sequence watching the her sequences that she's in and she's like why do they use that take or why do they do that and so it was, it was she said it was a little bit hard for her to just enjoy the film as an outsider and then uh surprisingly after shocker um she uh, also she also talks about how Peter Berg was a very strong-willed individual. She mentions how he was actually a lot older than he looked in the film, and she was talking about how she was not really surprised that he would go on to become successful, but she was really surprised that he'd go on to become such a successful director because he he even she even said that he had told her about that that he wanted to be a director, and. Uh, she then praises Lone Survivor and says she like watched it like eight times and gives him a lot of uh, credit for his for his uh, direction. He's not perfect. I mean, he did direct Battleship, but hey, and I haven't seen Lone Survivor yet. But Peter Berg's not there are worse directors out there than Peter. So, um, but anyway, you find out that after Shocker, she decided pretty soon after that that she didn't want to act anymore. Uh, because she was tired of worrying about her weight and her looks and whether or not this other uh, actress is prettier than her. And I think the big thing that really did it for her was that she was up for this role in a Tom Berenger film. She doesn't really say what film it is. And she was supposed to play this uh, lover of his that shows up in his dreams and seduces him. And then you find out at the end of the movie that his lover, his wife is dead in a septic tank and that really hit home to her and she's like no I don't want to be doing this anymore because if she got to the point where she was in her 20s where which this is really fucking sucky this is a really shitty part of Hollywood to be honest especially for women uh, female act for actresses and she decided well you know, it's gonna be hard to get the good roles. I'm not gonna get the Julia Roberts roles because I'm not that much, I'm not on the A list. So uh, I don't I don't know enough people. So the closest I'm gonna get is a naked woman, or you know, or this or that, or in a horror film, you know, a dead woman in a bathtub, blah 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 blah. And she was like, I didn't really want to do that anymore. 
And then she decided that, you know, what I really want to do is I want to help people. And that's exactly what she did. She gave up her career in acting and uh, went into uh, counseling to and uh, legislation and things like that to help save ch child victims of rape. So in, in, a, in a way, she became a guardian angel for uh, these uh, young uh, rape victims and saved hundreds of lives from killers and sickos who are very much alike to Horace Pinker. So Horace Pinker isn't a real per isn't a real care he's not a real person, but he's based on real people. And uh Allison, Cammy Cooper actually went on to help people in real life and save them from people like Horace Pinker. And I thought that was just amazing. And uh, good for you, Cammy. That's an amazing thing. And and uh, she, she went from one career in acting to another career that was just as successful, if not even more so. I mean, how many actors or actresses can say that they acted in a few films when they were young and then also went on to save people's lives? I mean, that's, that's, I don't have any words for that. That's just some amazing, really awesome stuff. Anyway, that was, that was a good, that was a good uh, interview uh, with Cammie Cooper. She also talks about how the, the film has such a big fan base, how when she's out and about, people recognize her and, and, and she's surprised that the film has such a big fan base. Then there was a short about eight minute interview with uh, executive producer Shep Gordon called It's Alive. Where he talks about his former, his earlier production company Island Pictures. Which released art house films and like Kiss of the Spider Woman. Trip to Bountiful which both won Oscars. But they didn't make any money in the box office. And um, he decided that. From a friend, for, he found it from a friend of his that a lot of horror films make a lot of money in video rentals. They make the most money in rentals, and so he decided. And most of it's from these big name directors, like Wes Craven and John Carpenter. And so he decided to wanted he wanted to do something where he would be able to distribute these horror films with these directors like John Carpenter and Wes Craven but to do it without studio interference so these directors can create their visions and do it without any hindrances whatsoever and uh, just like he did with Island Pictures where he uh, took these art house films and gave them a a uh, chance in, in theatrical distribution and a chance to win some Oscars and so forth um, and so he was also the first guy to really do that. Before Merrimax, before the Weinsteins did that, there was Iowan Pictures. So Chef Gordon was very influential when it came to these type of uh, production companies that were uh, trying to appeal to the independent uh, film, genre, film, uh, film genre. To, to give these independent filmmakers the, the opportunity to get their films seen and uh, reviewed by the, the, the press and the media and um, possibly make a profit. And uh, Embassy Home Video also made a deal with Shep to release these films on, on video after they were released in theatrical, theatrically for, for limited releases. But that wasn't making that much money, so he decided he wanted to make more money, so decided, okay, let's do it with the horror. So he contacted John Carpenter and Wes Craven and he created, you know, he already had a record company called Alive Records, where he already had some hit albums already, like Alice Cooper's Poison and, and so forth and so on. So he decided he was going to create Alive Pictures. And uh, he had a lawyer friend of his that he was working really close with, who then ultimately became one of the big heads of Universal at the time. And so one of the first things he did was give... Uh, was talk to Shep and say, I want those John Carpenter and Wes Craven films. And I, you know, we'll take over distribution. But um, as for anything else, uh, we'll also give you guys whatever amount of money you need. 
Um, but that's it. We're not sending people to the set. Well, we're staying completely out of it. We're just distributing the films. And that's that was huge. And uh, that enabled Wes and John Carpenter to create their visions, their what to do what they wanted to do without studio interference, without studio heads and executives coming in and, and meddling like what Wes had to deal with with Deadly Friend. So um, that's how you're able to get a film like Shocker uh, and, and films like They Live, People Under the Stairs and Prince of Darkness is because of this company. And it, it was uh, short-lived, but it created so many great, wonderful, memorable horror films that still stand out to this day because, as as Chef Gordon said, they were able to give the, the live pictures is able to give these filmmakers an opportunity to deliver their visions unhomogenized, where they weren't homogenized, where they weren't, you know, changed up for the reasons for because the producers wanted it wasn't there was no we need to appeal to everybody type thing. That's why there weren't super big hits, but they're really fondly remembered by so many people because they were great visions and they were great stories and they were able to be told without any interference. That's how, honestly, uh, that's something that's missing from a lot of uh, major studio companies nowadays is this, this uh, ability to just have filmmakers just make their films, period, and tell their stories without these producers trying to get, butt their heads in and say, no, well, this is what we want you to tell our story, but that's not, you're not the guys and they're not the people who are creating this. You're just the guys who are, who are behind the scenes distributing it and giving us the money to create it. And it, it doesn't, you're not the one that created any of this. You're not the creator. So why the, why are you trying to change my vision? So you, you okayed my vision originally and now you're wanting to change it. Like, Why'd you hire me in the first place? Why'd you give me an opportunity to get my vision on screen if you weren't wanting that vision in the first place? So, in a way, Live Films was much like an independent film company. It was just it was amazingly, shockingly able to have an agreement with Universal Pictures to just release these films and finance them, but stay completely out of it. And even Chef Gordon himself was talking to Wes and John. He's like, I don't want to know anything about these movies. I don't even want to know the, the, the title. I, and I don't want to. I want to read the script. I don't want anything that you just do what you want to do. I'll give you some money if you choose to use all of it. That's up to you. If not, that's cool. But I just, you know, make your films. And I love that. That's really great. I really want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much, Chef, for giving the, these for Wes and John Carpenter to, to give those excellent filmmakers an opportunity to just play in the sandbox and in a era where studio interference was really, really starting to rear its ugly head. It started in the 70 late seventies versus early 1980 with uh, heaven's gate. And it just got progressively worse ever since. And so to just give these filmmakers carte blanche was just a really great thing to do. Um, he also talked about how the last film he really was produced, he produced without, you know, it wasn't from his own production company. It was a 1982 film called Endangered Species with Robert Urich. And it was an MGM film. It was about the cattle mutilations and stuff like that. And been going on at the time. And he, uh, he didn't really want Robert Urich, even though he liked Robert Urich. It's just he was forced upon him by the studio because he was a big popular uh, TV actor at the time for a show made, made him released by MGM. So there's a scene in the film where Robert Urich is in a swamp and he's got like a, a straw in his mouth and he's trying to hide from a helicopter and there's a helicopter just a few feet over his head. And uh, the, 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 the production of the film was shut down after they shot that sequence. Because the producers came on the set and the studio, I mean, not, not the producers, the studio heads came on the set and said they shut it down. And they shut it down because Robert Urich's hair wasn't parted right. His hair looked messy. We can't have our movie stars looking messy. But even Chef Gordon's like, wait a second, there's a helicopter just a few feet over his head. And he's underwater, his hair is going to look messy. 
But they're like, no, you need to reshoot that sequence. His hair's got to be parted the right, right way. And so that's just how stupid. That's how dumb a lot of these studio heads are. Get these fucking idiots out of the production process of a film. All you should be fucking doing is making the movie. You should just be providing the funds and releasing the film. That's all you should be doing. You shouldn't be writing it. You shouldn't be making it something that you think people want to see. Let the, the directors and you know make their films. You gotta if you have to come in and for example with something like Heaven's Gate and say hey you're spending way too much money on reshoots and craziness, please do pull the plug then. But if it's just a vision you're not sure of and you don't really like, like Josh Trank's Fantastic Four, then stay the fuck out of it and let the director just do what he wants to do. If it fails, fine. But at least you gave him the opportunity to give his all and do what he wanted to do in the first place. To handcuff these directors, to handcuff these screenwriters, to completely change everything up and almost in some instances completely change the film entirely like Deadly Friend it is just it's uncalled for it, it's just it's complete arrogance by this by these studio heads and it's 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 unfortunately it's not changing anytime soon so um but yeah the the very small period in time through the late 80s and early 90s where live films is able to give John Carpenter and Wes Craven the ability to just do whatever they wanted with their films was just a really great thing. And I think it's something that I think a lot of us really take for granted. We took that that frame of time for granted because look what we got now. I mean, so many, so many filmmakers are just not able to make their films the way that they want to um, because of just studio heads and all this other bullshit. But anyway, um, yeah. I uh, just wanted to to talk about that um, the the uh, segment it's alive with Shep Gordon. Um, then the next uh, uh, little featurette was the longest one about 25 minutes. It's uh, no more Mr. Nice Guy the music was shocker which I really had a blast watching because I love this soundtrack. It's an excellent soundtrack. So you have interviews with one of the guys from Megadeth talks about no more Mr. Nice Guy. Uh, you have uh, you, you they talk with the producer. De Desmond Child, who also helped write some of the songs for, for uh, the Dudes of Wrath, which is a super group they formed uh, for the song Shocker and Shock Dance, with vocals by not only Paul Stanley, but also Alice Cooper. Mitch Pileggi talks about how much fun he had doing a rap with Alice Cooper. I mean, that must have been an absolute blast. Um... And then you hear from Kane Roberts, Alice, one of Alice Cooper's guitarists, who played the construction worker in the film. And he talks about how he had a lot of fun doing backup vocals for uh, uh, the song Shocker with Paul Stanley. And then you have the, uh, uh, there's a writer, a uh, guy who helped uh, write the song uh, Sword, in the St Sword in Stone. He worked with uh, Kiss. And, um, Originally, it was a song that was supposed to be on uh, a Kiss album. And they even did a demo track with Paul Stanley. But if for some reason, the producers just didn't want it. But they did choose four of his other songs. But So he was always all bummed out. Like, oh, man. I think, it was, I think his last name was Kulik. And, and he was all, oh, man. You know, I wish I, I wish they took my other song. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? Uh, um... But I'm I'm just uh, I'm just checking to see who exactly I want to make sure I got the guy's name who uh, who uh, did the Desmond Child and Max Norman yeah but it, it's based on Bruce Kulick yeah I was right Bruce Kulick uh, written by uh, Desmond Child and Paul St Desmond Child Child and Paul Stanley and uh, so. Yeah, he was bummed I didn't choose that song, but uh, Desmond Child, who had produced some uh, Kiss albums and 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 so forth, he liked the song and he decided uh, let's let's uh, do this for the Shocker soundtrack. They also talked to they also speak to one of the one of the guys from the band Dangerous Toys. He he explains how 
uh, Desmond Child wanted, and West actually wanted the song Demon Bell. And originally, it was a, it was supposed, it was a, uh, it was like a demo track that, that they were working on. And it was originally going to be the song of the title album, Dangerous Toys. It was, it was called, they're going to call it Dangerous Toys. But they, they ended up um, reworking it because that really wasn't going to work with Shocker. And so uh, the guy who, who helped write it, uh, he, he ended up, who was one of the band members, he was ended up on the phone with Desmond Child for like three hours and they wrote the song uh, with the lyrics and everything and decided to call it Demon Bell, the Ballad of Horace Pinker. And even Dangerous Toys guy says the people to this day still remember that song. And he, sound, he signed countless CDs and, and, and even vinyls of the soundtrack. And he talks about how he's surprised the soundtrack has such a big following. And I'm like, you shouldn't be. It's a great soundtrack. Uh, they're, they're really, really great horror soundtracks are hard to find. And this is definitely one of them. And then... You know, they also, of course, Megadeth, they talk about uh, No More Mr. Nice Guy and how at this point in time, there was only like two of the original band members. There was Dave Mustaine and there was oh, another guy and there was like a drummer. There's one of the guitarists and there was like a drummer guy. And so that's why the music video was so uh, cheap looking. And there was like a barely, there's just a lot of shots of Dave Mustaine on guitar and a lot of film footage. Um... No More Mr. Nice Guy was suggested by, of course, Desmond Child, who would work with Alice Cooper for Poison. And he decided, you know, we could, there would be a good song to cover, would be No More Mr. Nice Guy. And they were looking through their, their, uh, looking through guys to do the song with, and they thought Megadeth just stood out. Dave Mustaine was like a perfect guy to sing the song No More Mr. Nice Guy. And so they did that, and it was one of the first big songs to really get Megadeth out there. Uh, they even, uh, but they never really played it live and any of their live shows. And, uh, the guy, the guy from Megadeth talks about how he heard it on the radio. And then like the, the, the guy in the radio, the radio DJ would say, and that was a cover of Alice Cooper's no more Mr. Nice guy. Uh, and, and they would just never say, they would not say Megadeth. Uh, so they wouldn't say it on the radio. And so uh, Desmond Child also talks about uh, Timeless Love and how he contacted the New, Jer New Jersey band Soraya because he liked their, their uh, look and their sound. And he contacted them to do the song Timeless Love and he wrote it originally for an Oscar. And I guess it did get selected. out. It was, it was like number 85 or something out of 100 uh, titles selected for Oscar nominations. But even Desmond Child's like, yeah, and yeah, no one's no one's gonna vote for a song from Shocker, the soundtrack. But he, but he, uh, but he's proud of the song regardless, because at least it did get on a vote. It did get on the list. So it was it was a song he he wanted to get made, so he could. It was the first song he ever submitted to the Academy, uh, and it did get it on the list of, of top songs. It just wasn't nominated. Um, it's a beautiful song. It's a great ballad. And so, yeah, uh, it, this is, it was a really a lot of fun to watch this, uh, this sit down. They talk with the it's interviews with all these guys who worked on the soundtrack and, and, uh, I really, really love, love this soundtrack. So it was great to see a little bit on how it was made and what, and then, and, uh, how things were put together. Um, and of course, you know, just hearing the songs again was a lot of fun. And and they have footage from the Megadeth music video in this in this uh, featurette, but they don't have the whole music video on here, which I don't really get. That's one thing about this Blu-ray that's it's a little bit lacking. But anyway, yeah, that's it for the featurettes. Then of course you have the theatrical trailer, you have the TV and radio spots. Radio spots were was kind of fun to listen to. I mean, because that's something you never hear now. You don't hear radio spots for movies. Kind of miss that, actually. Vintage Interviews, which is about eight minutes total. There's about a three-minute interview with Wes Craven at first where he's talking about uh, Shocker and why he wanted to do it. He wanted to do... Really, what Wes wanted to do with Shocker is he wanted to make his own franchise because he wasn't getting barely... He was getting nothing from New Line pretty much in terms for, for residuals or anything for, for Freddy. And New Line was just making bank right and left. 
He was getting none of that money. So he wanted to create his own franchise with Shocker. Things didn't work out uh, for whatever reason. I'm actually glad they did because um, I don't know how much a sequel would really hold up. But I still would have, would have loved to have seen it regardless. Um, and there's actually a screenplay which I will be talking about in the near future. Yes, there is actually a treatment for Shocker 2. Um, but anyway, Wes is talking about it and how he wanted to really make a film that focused on the real life terror that you see on television. Where, you know, there almost every day now you see on the news there's more and more violence and more and more terror. And you wanted to focus on that and make, and make someone like Freddy, but for the television world. And still have still be a world that can have those surreal nightmarish imagery and still have fun with things like like Freddy did, but in a different way. And uh, that's what he did. That's that's what Shocker ended up being. He also was talking about how uh, some of the things people are the most afraid of. Uh, he wanted to tap into that, and, and a lot of people are afraid of real things, of real killers, and so he wanted to tap into it with Horace Pinker, who was. He was, this, so he was this psychotic killer who's killing families, and now he's he's now has the ability to travel through your airwaves, which I, which honestly is still a really great idea. And uh, talks about how he was talking to one one uh, cast cast member, and she was talking about how she's afraid of, of certain things, like these people who kidnap people in vans and so he incorporated that into Horace Pinker's van which is all beat up and worn out and um, he talked about how the film was meant to be he said it quite succinctly he said I think the film is a roller coaster ride which it, it like I said in, in my why I love shocker video it absolutely is it's, it's a roller coaster ride um, he, he talks about how he wants to he wanted to scare you but at the same time keep you entertained I think he did an excellent job with that, and uh, so, so yeah. So there's a little bits of stuff, and there's like little interviews with with uh, Peter Berg and Mitch Pileggi, and Michael Murphy, and so forth and so on. Uh, the guy who's doing the narration on these featurettes is really schlocky. Like that guy's really not very good. Uh, he's a bit too campy for my tastes. But Wes had a lot of good things to say. Wes's presence is still felt here with the featurette article, you know, the little archival featurette interviews. Um, he was talking about replacing Freddy, which, I'm sorry, Wes, I'm never going to replace Freddy. Uh, he's, irre he's irreplaceable, but Horace is close. Horace is a close second. Um, but uh, in terms of Wes Craven uh, horror icon creations, for me personally, I, I, Ghostface is cool, but... I will take Horace Pinker over Ghostface. I really will. Um, but anyway, yeah, it was nice to hear that kind of stuff. But see a little bit of behind-the-scenes footage as well. That was nice to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, it really would have been nice to see uh, up-to-date interviews with uh, with Wes. But um, I think by the time this was being made, he was sadly suffering from brain cancer. So he was really, really sick. So... He, like, it's understandable why he would not be able to do that. Um, and then there's uh, like a still gallery, storyboard gallery. Storyboard gallery is it's kind of fun to see what, what they originally had. The original look they had for Horace was like this big chubby fat guy, like one of the Scolari brothers from Ghostbusters 2. And I'm really glad they went with a more athletic build for Mitch Pledgey. Because I didn't really need, I didn't really like the whole chubby fat guy horse pinker look. Um, and then the steel gallery, just there's a lot of you know photos that you saw in the other featurettes and and some pictures and stuff like the posters and and so forth and so on. It's just, it's like any other steel gallery really. Um, there was nothing really that spectacular, but it was still it was cool. It was still cool to look at. Um. Uh, as for what's missing, like I said, more uh, up-to-date interviews with Wes, but I understand why 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 uh, they weren't on the on this Blu-ray. Um, Peter Berg would have loved to have hear, heard his th on-camera thoughts on the film, but he was busy directing a movie, so um, he could not do it. Uh, just like Wes couldn't do it because of his illness. Um, 
Peter couldn't do it because he's busy directing a film. But I've seen interviews of Peter Berg about the film, and he's still he's still he's still a fan of the film. In fact, he's he's even advocated maybe even directing a remake or a sequel and, and being involved with a new, another shocker in some capacity. He does talk about the visual effects he thinks are, are pretty bad, but I disagree with him. I think they're really good for the low budget the film had to work with. Um, one scene in particular I really love is a scene where, and it's something we take for granted nowadays, is the scene where Pinker disintegrates in, in, in flames. It was all done practically and on camera, and it looks very realistic and great is a real fire and it's real physical effects and it's not done in a, inside a computer um i'll take that type of effects any day and, and the optical effects over over cgi but that's just me personally um so yeah it's missing a little bit of that it would have been nice to see a little bit on the visual effects uh there was nothing about that there's nothing there's no little there's no behind the scenes a little, little few shots of west directing in in one of the featurettes but Nothing really on that aspect of the film. But um, either way, it's still a really great Blu-ray. I, I really would highly recommend this Blu-ray. Definitely to fans of the film. And it, and, and fans of horror horror films in, in general. If you're a fan of Screen Factory's Blu-rays, this is definitely one you should definitely pick up. It's definitely one of their best uh, efforts. They, they And they, do, they have a lot of great horror Blu-rays. So... Um, this is definitely one of them. Anyway, I really don't know what else to say. I've talked for almost an hour on just the Shocker Blu-ray, but I wanted to go really in-depth on it because um, it was a wonderful gift from Corey, and I, I just wanted to, to give it my all, and I love the film. So, anyway, the, you know, so I, I couldn't do anything else than really go in depth on this blu-ray but anyway thank you for watching my rev my blu-ray review of shocker from screen factory and i will see you guys later see ya